When travelling in time and space, the Doctor claimed that his wonderful scarf was knitted by Madame Nostradamus, a witty little knitter, but actually a lady called Begonia Pope is who we are to be grateful for for the original. As John Pertwee regenerated into Tom Baker, I personally feel that his choice of costume became one of the most iconic items of Doctor Who, along with the TARDIS. His scarf oversaw the almost end of the Daleks, battled a ridiculous Loch Ness monster in all its forms, travelled to the 15th century in Renaissance Italy, and was copied by a companion when they regenerated. It travelled to France in the modern day, 1970s. Over Tom Baker's run in the show as the Doctor, it changed throughout the seasons. It started off extra long, got shortened to more, more practical length, and then, in an effort to make it more ridiculous, got even longer and longer, until finally it changed colour completely. All of these changes can be found on the wonderful website DoctorWhoScarf.com, which I will include a link to, which has detailed patterns, which is what I use to create my scarf, and you can use them also. They have recommended yarn quantities and yarns to use, which is how I went about choosing the Jamesons of Shetland yarn for my scarf, and um, they had colour suggestions, although I had to make up a few of my own. So thank you to the Doctor Who Scarf website, and I'll include a link to it below. But where in all of time and space do you start? Well, as quite often in the case, with some tension. I decided to knit some tension swatches to see how my yarn related to what the pattern recommend you use. And the yarn recommends that I knit with a three and three quarter millimetre needle or an old size nine. And I cast on the number of stitches that the scarf recommends, which is 56 stitches, which should, in their double knit and their needle size, achieve 11 inch wide scarf. With my needles and my yarn, so the three and three, three quarter millimetre needles and the Jameson's double knit yarn, that only produced an eight and three quarter inch wide scarf, which actually for me is a perfectly good width. I then tried the size up needles from that, which produced a nine inch wide scarf, so that was with four millimetre needles. And I got a nine and three quarters to ten inch wide scarf sample with four point five millimeter needles, which is what the pattern recommends, but that's getting a bit too large for this yarn. So, and I don't want my scarf to be as wide as the original, and so actually one of these would be so either the eight and three quarter or the nine inch wide would be would be fine for me to wear it. I'll show you how I tried that out as well. Testing out the width of the scarf merely involved trying on some other scarves I already have knitted and holding the tension swatches up to my neck to see what they look like. So the wonderful Doctor Who scarf website provides patterns both in number of rows and in recommended inches. So depending on how your yarn knits up, you can work out what works best for you. And I went with the calculation they used for rows and yardage but my yarn has worked out a little bit smaller than that, so I will not produce a scarf of this size with my yarn. If I wanted to make it to the right scale with my yarn, I have got the inches guide here for how deep each stripe is. But again, I probably don't have the enough, enough yarn for that. I could always buy some more. And um, I don't really want the full Tom Baker length. So according to the inches, it would be 66 inches long on each side. So this would be 66 inches and this. And although I could just about get away with wearing that without it dragging on the floor, there's a high chance it would grow like the original. So I probably want to go for a bit short. So with my estimation of how my yarn knits up, I'm going to end up with rather than, if I use all of the row calculations, but using my slightly narrower yarn, I'm going to end up with a scarf about 55 inches long. And to be honest, that's just gonna clear the floor for me. And if I add the tassels, then it would make it longer. So I think we're going to knit with the recommended row size, but my smaller needles and my thinner yarn. Uh, but I'm going to start down here and I'm gonna have a look at what the first two blocks look like. So that's six rows of the purple and 44 rows of the oatmeal and sort of have a look at the scale and see what that's like, whether I actually need to switch to knitting it to the blocks by inches rather than the, the row count. So I hope that makes some sense. 
I know you saw them come out the packet, but I'm just going to introduce you to my beautiful, beautiful yarns from Jameson's of Shetland. I love how they tone together. Going with the, the Doctor Who scarf colour guide, I'm happy with the purple. I'm obviously delighted with the oatmeal, the burnt umber, the mustard, the rust. My blue-grey, I've gone for a colour called Stonehenge that now looks very, very blue but is there to represent a sort of grey-blue colour on the scarf. And then for the green, I've actually gone for this old gold, which is more of a khaki brown colour, which, again, to my colour palette and what I like, that's really well suited. But um, if you look at the original, it does tend to look a bit greener. Although it is, that is the colour recommendation from the Doctor Who scarf website, if you're going with Jameson's. And, um, yeah, I'm absolutely delighted with them. The only one that's a bit bright is the blue, but I think tonally... They blend, oh, I love how they blend together. So that's my lovely yarn. All right, we're ready to start. So I have my needles ready. They are labeled as a, U, as a UK three and three quarter millimeter, which I think would more normally be called a 3.75 millimeter. They're an old UK size nine and a US size five. And that's the smallest of my knitting samples, which is gonna create the tightest, the sort of tightest knit, um, knitted gauge. And my first two colours is the Jameson's Double Knit in Clover and Jameson's Double Knit in, in Oatmeal. So this is the one that I've bought the most wools of. I've bought two of all the other shades and four of this. I suspect I'm going to end up having to buy more yarn, but I've got enough to get me started. I've never cast on on a video before and I only know one method of casting on, so if you're wondering why I do it like this, it is because it's the only way I know how to cast on. So let's get started. 56 stitches, here we go. Fifty-two, fifty-four, fifty-five. Finally, there. Fifty-six. Fifty-six stitches, ready to start. And as I've probably already stated, and if you ever looked at the original scarf, the whole thing is knit in garter stitch. So that's every stitch and every row is a knit stitch and I'm going to have to switch filming to differently to this because I don't have enough room, I don't have enough clearance for the end of my needles here to get up any speed. Um, the only technique that's used in this apart from the knit stitch is that the last stitch of every row is slipped to create a distinctive edge that was seen on the original scarf, although not apparently on the stunt scarf. That's gonna be the only thing I'm gonna to have to remember to do is to slip the last stitch. So when I get there, I'll show you. So that's the only effect to achieve is the little wrap at the end of the row when you turn around. Um, all of the joins on the original scarf were made on the same side so that you have a neat front and the uh, colour change on the back. I'll show you when we get there what that looks like. There were later scarves where areas were grafted back on to remove damaged areas where they didn't pay attention to that so there are shots of the original scarf with the knitting colour changes. The colour changes of the knitting are showing more prominently. I'm not going to be copying that. There was also some very distinctive ways of joining the thread, joining the yarns on the original scarf that I'm probably not going to do because every single one was slightly different. And to create a screen accurate scarf, I would need to copy 
how many stitches are done in a particular way on every colour change row and I just want a neat plain colour change because I don't want to be explaining to everyone why it looks like that if I go for the screen accurate one but I absolutely love the fact that the the Doctor Who scarf website have worked out where those colour changes should be if you wish to be that screen accurate. I've only recently learnt what the difference between what is sometimes called English and Continental or English and European or even English and Belgium knitting is and it turns out I don't quite do either. I think I, the nearest I do is English style knitting but I don't hold this yarn in this hand. I keep it all on this yard and fling it round. No. So I think I knit English style, which is where you hold the yarn in your right hand and flip it round your needle. Right, so I'm at my last stitch. So this is the one I just slip knitwise onto the needle. Turn. And then this wraps around to create the edge of the scarf and we carry on. Right, we've got another another five rows in this purple. We're, we're, we're going to be here for some time. This is not going to be a particularly riveting experience. So, so going back to English and European or English and Belgian, um, there are obviously worldwide variations on those names for the styles of knitting, plus whole other styles of knitting out there as well. So I've never really looked into it because as I said, I just was taught to knit and I've been left to get on with it. So if you're interested in exploring other styles of knitting, oh, there's so much out there and it's, it's so interesting. But for my everyday knitting, I just knit the way I knit because that's how my fingers and my brain know how to do it. I've tried introducing new things and I always end up resorting to what my fingers know and I imagine for some people that's the same while others are always looking for a new technique that might make them more efficient or more speedy or more smooth or more even. There's, there's so much out there you can do. I must admit because I knit an awful lot of four ply socks that knitting double knit suddenly seems very chunky, even though I'm using the smallest of the needle sizes that they recommended. I've just seen how unbearably wonky this is. Can we straighten it up at all? No, you're just gonna have to live a wonky life like I do. Right, last stitch again, so slip that knitwise and turn. Off we go again, row number three. All right, so we've got the six rows. So that's three garter ridges there, three garter ridges there. It measures about three quarters of an inch, which is what I was expecting. Now, if this was the um, full worsted weight yarn, this should actually be measuring an inch for those six rows but mine's only measuring three quarters, but I think I'm happy with that. And the width is coming up as eight and a half on here, but I had blocked my little samples and this hasn't been blocked or pressed yet. So um, hopefully that will come up a little bit wider. Although to be honest, I actually quite like the narrower width. It makes it less oversized and less like Tom Baker's, but on me as a person, having knitted one that was wider before, I actually think the narrow width is okay and that might that might even up a little bit with blocking. So we'll carry on with that. And we are now ready to change colour. I've slipped the last stitch and I still want to wrap the purple around, but I also want to introduce my new colour. So the original Doctor Who scarf had a very distinctive way of changing colour that had a few stitches from the new colour showing through to the old colour and an interesting way of sort of knotting off that was probably done for speed. There are whole videos on the internet on YouTube explaining how to do this. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to just do a colour change how I would normally do a colour change on a knit row. The way I'm doing this is to get my new colour, insert my needle ready to do my first knit stitch, bring the purple yarn that's going to be woven in for now round to the back as if I'm going to knit with it, add my new yarn, knit that stitch as normal but also tighten up any, the purple a bit and then 
With my new yarn, do a stitch, insert my needle ready for the next one, but I'm going to wind my loose ends to the back and sort of weave them in so that when it comes to threadling all my ends in at the end and weaving in the loose threads at the end of the scarf, they're already knitted a little bit into the scarf so that they don't come undone easily. So, so I do my next stitch like that, prepare the next one and this is when I like to twist my loose ends of both colours in like that so they're caught up in the knitting but not actually knitted in. So on the front, a neat colour change with no loops and you're just getting the new stitches and on the back I'm just twisting in the loose ends which are the short ends of my purple right it's not it would be a short end of the purple but it's not because I haven't cut it out so I'm just weaving in the purple and the short end of the oatmeal and I'm just twisting them around the yarn that I'm knitting with I'm picking up the wrong one there will be a beautifully clear video on the internet of how to do this don't need to follow mine so neat stitch on the front the greatest lesson in life I have learned with trying to make YouTube videos is trying to explain things that you just do and you don't even know why you do them you just do them because you do them and there you have teaching and the fact that I am not a teacher just someone who loves making things so hats off to all those people that teach other people how to make things rather than just just make things all right that's brought my yarn along for a couple of rows. When I'm ready to weave my ends in, I can also then use a darning needle to weave these loose ends in, and I get no visible visible loose ends on the right side. This is where it's different to the hero scarf, where actually the, the color change color sort of comes through on both sides for a bit. I'm trying to give you the knitter's point of view of what it looks like when I knit. So I've got the camera on my lap, but what you're going to see is my thumb. So I wonder if we can do this in a better way, so you don't just see my thumb. I'm also starting to go slightly long-sighted, so this slightly too close, over-focused point of view is exactly how I feel in life now, because I'm holding my yarn too close to my face, because I'm used to doing that, because I'm short-sighted. I don't actually like the effect of the slip stitch edge but I've started so I'm damn well going to carry on with it now until it becomes natural and part of knitting and there's certainly enough scarf to make it do that. Ah, I didn't slip the last stitch, what was that about it becoming natural? Let's go back. Slip, turn, knit. Stitch. All right, we're at a stage where I can make, see whether it's worth carrying on with the oatmeal and I like the scale, it's coming up. So if I follow, if I was, if my yarn was knitting up exactly as the pattern recommended, we should actually be looking at about two inches worth of knitting now. And we're just under we are really under an inch and a half. I like the scale, I like how it's coming out. I'm going to finish the rest of the oatmeal and assess it from there as to whether I need to go deeper on my colour bands. I think not. Aside from all of that, I absolutely adore how it's coming out. I'm really happy with the, really happy with the tension and the knit. It's just not coming out quite as deep as the original, but I'm very happy with how it's looking. So I'm much happier now with the, the wrap effect with the last slip stitch. I understand why I'm doing it. I understand the effect it's creating, how it's wrapping around that last stitch. And that's completely different to how my other garter stitch scarf looks with no wrapping. So you get the little wrap around effect here. It's a bit, it's a bit iffy down there because I wasn't quite doing it right. And this is my non-wrapped garter stitch edge of a very stretched scarf. So it's this little 
I mean, it doesn't look that much different, I'll be perfectly honest, but I think I understand why I'm doing it now and what it's creating when I do it. All right, I've done a further couple of rows and we're now up to a nice solid five inch chunk of oatmeal. So now it's time to join the umber on. Right, I think we could perhaps cut some of these ends off now as I have committed to the length and the scale. Right, that's got the oatmeal out the way. And where's the purple? There we are. Trying to give you a little bit of distance to actually see what it looks like. All right, we've finished with the burnt umber. Now it's time for the gold. I'm not going to show you every colour change because I cannot think of anything more boring. So from now on, it's going to be more stylistic shots of me knitting because you've seen everything I intend to do demonstrated in these first three colours. I may vary how I join on my new yarn. I might try the hero, hero way of knitting in. As I said, there is a link to how to do that properly and screen accurately if that's what interests you. Otherwise, I'm going to just carry on doing what is more similar to the stunt scarf join, where the stitches are just caught in the back of your travelling yarn. So yeah, let's cast on the yellow and... or the gold, rather. No, sorry. Mustard. Let's cast. In today's light this looks so blue and on the website it looked very grey and in my pictures of the original scarf some lights it looks really blue, some lights it looks really grey. Um, so we're just going to work with that. Looks like Wesley Crusher's sweatshirt at the moment doesn't it with that colour combination. It's very blue. It doesn't look at all grey. But then, in which picture? That picture there, it looks really blue too. And in that picture there, it looks really grey. Obviously, they're different pictures, different qualities, and they're all printed off on my printer, which is not, not the highest of quality. Who just messed up? I was so eager to start the blue, I missed out the purple. <laughs> so back we go. Only two rows. Mm, only four rows in. Only four rows in. Right, back to the purple. Six rows. No? Count again. Yeah, six rows. you're tangled in my spider chain. Of course you are. All right, so all of the colours have been established. So from now on, it's just repeating them in the order according to the chart. Um, it's definitely coming out much smaller, as you can tell. We should be considerably longer than this if it was coming out at the correct gauge. I'm not going to do anything about that. I'm going to knit the scarf at the gauge it's coming out in the colour chart order and just accept that my scarf will be shorter. And because I have had one before that was 
Tom Baker length which meant it dragged on the floor when I wore it. It wasn't always that practical and in order to make it so you could walk without it damaging on the ground I did used to have to wrap it round quite a lot. Round and round and round I did have to wrap it round quite a lot. So we're going to go with it the length it comes out. That might be a disappointing thing, it might not, it might be just right and if it goes anything like the original scarf, as I get the weight from it, from it building in length, it's probably going to stretch a bit as well. So my next colour according to the chart is back to mustard and I'll try and give you some other view than just me sitting here. Let's see what interesting places I can take my knitting now that we're, now that we're getting started. Holding my knitting close to my chest because I haven't ironed my linen shirt today and I don't intend to. It turns out I was using the wrong chart. I should have been using this one for a sport double knit or light worsted. So I will explain, <laughs> I'll explain what's going on and what I should have been using and how it's affected my scarf. So from this point onwards, I switched to following the inches chart. So from here up to this ongoing point, we are now at the right scale. And if I move between this, this chart and double check on this chart, I will now be at the right scale. So it does mean here to, uh, wherever I just pointed to, here purple line to purple line is the too small section. But I'm going to leave it and just carry on for now. time for a check-in. So I reached the halfway point while I was away at Ways Fest, which is this, this stripe here. So everything from this stripe onwards. Um, and then I could also sort of assess lengthwise where it was and how much more wool I was going to buy because I was going to have to buy more wool. Following the, the yarn guide that I, that I did that was the incorrect one, the only colour I was going to skimp on was this green and I thought well it's not my favourite colour I don't mind but because I needed more of the rust as well and more of the colour that should be grey and is very blue on screen um, or on my screen it is blue it's very blue on some of Tom's pictures but it's very grey on some of Tom's other pictures so that's just one of those things uh, I needed more of the so I needed more rust more rust more blue more green um, not that much in the case of the rust and the and the blue but also a feature of the scarf is the tassels and I was going to have nothing left of those colours for the tassels so I've now ordered those three balls and they've arrived um, in less than a week this time deeply impressed for second class post from the Shetland Islands remember and um, and I'm actually ready to take the scarf on tour again so I'm off to Cornwall with a little with a little geeky visit on the way down in the drive that I will <laughs> reveal when I get there provided it isn't raining sideways and then yes yeah, so me and the scarf are on a little holiday so hopefully I shall get some more more knitting done there been doing to your ears I guess this gets us to the crux 
think she likes my podcast choice. Scarf's on tour. We have everything we need. We have a scarf, we have an umbrella, we have snacks, water, instructions. I've never done this before. Instructions on how to get to Hound Tour on Dartmoor. I'll explain more why when we get there. Um, and off we go. I've just stopped by the fairy woods near my house to record this, so I better move on before they come to ask me why I'm why I'm waiting here. All right then, take care, bye-bye. Well, I've made it to Dartmoor. It's stunning and as expected, it's pouring with rain. So You'll stop with me in my car. I'll talk quickly about why I want to be here. So one of my reasons for visiting Dartmoor is I love the, well, I like Sherlock Holmes. I enjoy Hound of the Baskervilles. I enjoyed Sherlock's Hound of the Baskerville, Hounds of the Baskervilles, or whichever way they called it, they pluralized something. Um, but my real love of that story is Laurie R. King's Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes stories. So the, the book that features them is called The Moor, and it does revisit the story of the Hound and Sherlock Holmes' adventures there. So I really wanted to come here because of that. I don't have time to do the walking across the moor that they do. But my re reason for visiting Hound Tour is a bit more geeky because the 1970s season 12 episode of Doctor Who, The Sontaran Experiment, which is Tom Baker's third adventure, was filmed here as well. It's a two-parter. It's actually set hundreds of years in the future. So although it's filmed on Dartmoor, you've actually got to pretend it's London because that's where you're actually meant to be in central London thousands of years in the future. Um, so that's why we're here. That's why I've brought the scarf here. And actually the sun's come out now, so we better make our little trip up to the tour in between the rainstorms. today it would be perfect and the sun's coming out I'm in Cornwall now, which is um, there's a fairly easy drive from from leaving Dartmoor, which I wish I'd spent had the whole day to explore Dartmoor to be honest, but I can go back and do that another day. I just spent an hour walking round Hound Tour, which was everything I'd hoped it would be. All of it just looked like the Sontaran experiment. Um, Deeply impractical to try and knit up there. You are not following me for amazing footage and video effects, so you would have just had terrible, terrible footage if I'd carried on trying to film my experiences there. But I had a lovely time. I was also very conscious that Tom Baker fell over and broke his collarbone filming there, so me carrying an umbrella, a camera, my knitting, and a handbag, and not looking where I was going was going to probably end up in a a nightmarish situation so best to look at where I'm putting my feet I think. It rained a lot as well but I've always expected that with Dartmoor. I just thought I'd talk about why books have led me there in a way. 
So the Mary Russell books by Laurie R. King, if anyone is a fan of Sherlock Holmes and also early, early 20th century history, I would really recommend Mary Russell and Sherlock Holmes adventures. The first one is called The Beekeeper's Apprentice and is set in 1914-15. 1915 I think it starts. Um, it isn't the first way I encountered Sherlock Holmes. I had read Study in Scarlet before that, before reading um, before reading the Laurie R. King books, so that was good, but you don't actually need to have read any Sherlock Holmes to enjoy, to enjoy Mary Russell, because it introduces enough Sherlock history and its own history to be an enjoyable series as it is. But it made me laugh as I was leaving Dartmoor that it was actually a Doctor Who missing adventure book, so these were published by Virgin Media in the, mostly in the 90s I think. By the time by the time Paul McGann became the Doctor in 96, was it? 96, 98? Around that time. It switched over back to BBC publishing like adventures of the Doctors that were called the Missing Adventures. So that's what they were called when they were Virgin Media. Um, and then they became BBC books and they were just written by um, people who wanted to write Doctor Who stories that you hadn't seen. So they're made up stories so they could always be a bit more adult and adventurous than TV could go. And the first... And the first way I encountered Dartmoor was through one of those books where the Doctor and Sarah, so the fourth Doctor and Sarah Jane Smith, land on Dartmoor in the TARDIS sometime in the 19th century, pre the Sherlock Holmes books being written, but they're on Dartmoor, they're attacked by a, a ginorm, enormous hound, um, and they encounter Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who at that point is just Arthur Conan Doyle, a ship's surgeon. And he and they go on an adventure on Dartmoor and meet a juvenile or teenage Rudyard Kipling and a mad scientist who's experimenting on people and animals, hence why there's an there's a enormous hound running around the, the Dartmoor. And the idea is that Arthur Conan Doyle is inspired by the Doctor to create Sherlock Holmes. So, yeah, that made me... That made me very happy. Then we... um, and then when Tom Baker had finished playing the Doctor, he then went on to play Sherlock Holmes and is in a production, a BBC production of Hound of the Baskervilles that has all the production quality of a Doctor Who episode of the 70s, although it would be the 80s by then, I suppose, if he'd finished being the Doctor. Um, so, yeah, so actually it was a Doctor Who missing adventure, the name of which I... The name of which is actually Evolution by John P. Which I have forgotten. I think it might be called Weird Science. Mermaids end up in it as well. It's very... I've read it many times. Probably don't need to read it again. But yeah, so actually, thinking about it, that was my first encounter of Sherlock Holmes. And it's not even Sherlock Holmes. It's Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Then I, then I read Study in Scarlet. Then I read the Mary Russell... No. Yes, then I read the Mary Russell books. Then I watched Sherlock... Then I read the whole of Sherlock Holmes, and now I've been to Dartmoor, so I'm happy. It's become a blanket. Yeah. It's starting to become a blanket in its own right now. Welcome back to the Tom Baker Shrine. It's the 1st of October, and so hello spooky season to those that enjoy it. Um, I've been away for a couple of weeks, I've started a new job, um, so I shall be temporarily working away. So this is the last time you may see the Tom Baker Shrine for a while. Um, the scarf is very nearly done. It's still not as long as I'd like it to be, and I've kept, you know, once I'd worked out the inches to um, ridges ratio apart from that first sort of foot and a half that's just a bit too small which I'm actually adding on the length that's missing from there to the panels I'm doing now to the colours I'm doing now it's still only going to be floor length around if it's just around my neck going to the floor which you see in the picture uh, which you can see in the image and when I double it up it's not it's not full length so obviously I'm going to add some tassels to it and I'm going to have to block it so I think some length can be added and there will be some natural stretch when I start wearing it so I'm not going to do anything special to lengthen it because I will have once I've reached 
the right number of colour blocks for the pattern, that's the length it's going to be. And then blocking it and tasseling it and wearing it from there will have to just be its 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 final form. So not a not a completely screen accurate scarf, but I must admit I'm very pleased with how it's looking. Anyway, today we're just going to do some end finishing rather than any more knitting because I've done about a third of the end finishing and I don't want it to be a massive job when the knitting's completed. to almost the last colour changes. What have we got left to do? Mm. How long is it now? It is... I'll just get to the end of this row and I'll show you. It's still not as long as I thought it was going to be. But, I mean, I think it's long enough. To wear but it's not as long as his. So, I've got about another nine or ten inches left to knit. It sort of depends on how well that brown lasts to be honest. Okay. Coming up. I really hoped that today I'd be putting the last stitches on the scarf, and I'm not. Um, I am about to do the last colour change though, so the final act... The final act is to change from the rust red to a final band, four inches of purple. It may not be four inches, looking at how this purple is, but we'll do our best. And then it's time to block and add the tassels. So the tassels, a whole nother, th whole nother chapter, should be made up of all the colours of the scarf. However, mine will be made up of all the leftovers of the scarf, which at this stage is predominantly going to be rust red, because that's the one I have the most of, and then gold, and then the, or then the yellow gold, then the slate blue grey, the last of the oatmeal, which was really the sort of base colour, the last of the old gold and then I've got I've obviously kept these little wisps there's my hair caught in there these little wisps can you even see them yeah it's that much purple that much gold that much brown oh yeah and that much brown that's it for the brown so that's going to be the brown so that's what my tassels are going to be made of so as I say predominantly rust I'm not going to buy whole new balls of wool to finish the tassels but they should they should be a strand of each colour that they're going to be what's left and considering that none of my scarves have ever had the tassels on before, I'm going to do that and be done with it. So, time for a final colour change. Oh no, look, I've got one row of red left to do. All right, here we go. Goodbye, cinnamon, or whatever it was called. Cinnamon or rust, I can't remember which one it was. On to, on to the final purple. Onto the final purple or heather. Oh, there's a needle in there. Quite a good needle. And finally, slightly disappointingly, not in front of the Tom Baker shrine, I have put the last row on the scarf and I'm ready to cast off. So hopefully with a bird's eye view, slightly tilted, I'll now show you how I cast the scarf off.
slipping that last stitch. I mostly managed to remember to slip the stitches. Anyway, knit two, slip one over. First cast off stitch. Knit one, slip the last stitch over. You need to try and keep it loose, but not too loose. Because if you pull it too tight, it will affect. If it if you pull it too tight, it will affect the, the width of the casting off. And I want to try and keep it the same width as the scarf. So you can see the little sort of crochet effect or stitch effect casting off row. And carry on like that for the rest of the row until there are no stitches left. And now with that last stitch, knit, slip, and then pass, you can either break your yarn off, but pass your yarn through the last slip stitch, creating the last final stitch and casting off. And that's just one more end to wind in. So here we have the finished scarf. All that's left for me to do is to finish off the last of the ends. I was feeling very mean when I got to this brown one because that was the last of the brown yarn. So very short end there to weave in. That's all the ends and finally the purple from the very end. Just making up how I'm finishing this off because normally I'd actually use that to possibly sew up a garment but there's no, there's no sewing up on a scarf. And the same here at the bottom where I cast on. Mm, I don't like how I did that right at the beginning now where I overlapped lots of the, th lots of the yarn, but never mind, it's done. And as the last knit stitches are put onto the scarf, I decided to take myself on a little trip out to celebrate Doctor Who and the final stitches, although not the completed scarf. This is my trip to Wookie Hull Caves, which are a series of limestone caverns in Somerset, a tourist attraction known as a solutional cave, formed by a weathering process in which the natural acid in groundwater dissolves the rocks, creating the caverns 
and in 1975 they stood in for the planet Voga in the fourth Doctor's adventure, Revenge of the Cybermen. Although some of it was filmed in the BBC studios, the caves did feature as part of the adventure. It's the very first episode of Doctor Who I actually remember watching, so Wookiee Hole Caves have been in my mind for a very long time and I was really pleased to finally visit them, to take my scarf there and wear it. And to add to the feeling that I had walked into a very dodgy 1970s episode of Doctor Who, there was a dinosaur display um, talking about the Jurassic coastline of England southwest, which, um, yeah, as you can see, it really, really lived up to my Doctor Who dreams. <laughs> So using my <laughs> lap as a table here, it's time to do the tassels. I decided to cut 15 inches of each colour of yarn so that when they're folded over they'll look something like this and they should be about 6 inches finished so 15 inches of yarn gives me a bit to play with and knot on. I didn't have a darning needle big enough to fit them all through but I've got a hairpin and I'm just going to threadle them onto the bottom of the scarf. And I keep forgetting which way round to do it. To get the knotted effect on the right side. So pull all the yarn through. make a knot. Hmm, could have been better. Right, so I want one the other side. All right, and repeat until there's sevenly even seven evenly spaced along the hem. I thought I might run out of yarn for the tassels and have to make them all up of the red colour but actually apart from I've cut all the tassels in advance I'm missing two strands of which colour was it I'm missing two strands of this brown so two tassels will be without this brown but otherwise they will be made up of all the colours so I'm really pleased about that Right, tassels complete at that end and because I wanted to try it out off camera first of all here's one I did earlier, here's the other end sorry, let's try it the right way up there we are, all the tassels ready for a trim but I'm actually going to do that when I block the scarf because I think some of them are going to need neatening up a bit and a bit of steaming to get them lying nice and straight and then I'll give them a haircut so we're ready for the final stage. And here we have the remains of the scarf. Sorry, I'm just holding the camera so it's a bit wobbly. This is the actual yarn left over. This is all the lengths left over, of the same length that I'm going to keep for repairing the scarf, which is all that's, that's all of the colours except for um, <laughs> this brown, because there is none of that brown left at all. It all went into the tassels. So I'm going to keep these in my drawer that I keep all threads that are for repairing my clothes or all scraps of fabric that I keep for repairing my clothes. So hopefully the scarf will never need any more than this. I'd like to do something with these just because there's, I could keep them obviously in there for repair, but who knows if it will always be the yellow or the red that need repairing. Probably won't be, it'll probably be the browns and I don't have much of that. So I'd like to do something with these that uses them all up in entirety keep these for repairing the scarf and think of something to do 
with these little scraps because they just amuse me in their prettiness. But if I sort of carded them together, I'd end up with brown rather than a rainbow, wouldn't I? Welcome back to the shrine. <laughs> The scarf is now complete. Observant among you will notice I completely missed out the blocking. Despite excellent instructions on the Doctor Who scarf website, I decided that my scarf was neat and even enough and a length that I enjoyed. But if you wanted to make your scarf longer, that would have been your opportunity to block it when you blocked it. With still as yet untrimmed tassels, but I can live with that. Um, and complete, I've been wearing it. I love it. I love it so much. I've added a few more pictures to the shrine. I didn't manage the plan of adding a picture for every row I knitted, but you know, I think we can live. They aren't exactly that good a quality pictures that I'm printing out, and it was getting a bit wasteful if I'd done that. But I will keep them all. Um, I'm going to live with them as the shrine for a while, but I'll keep them all because you never know when they might come in handy. And although this isn't part of a complete Fourth Doctor cosplay, I actually like how it looks with the clothes that I wear on a daily basis. That was the whole idea of it. I did just indulge in one little edition, so rather than one of my Edwardian Tams, I did find on eBay a suitable brown fedora-y type hat. Um, it was a bit small when it came, but thanks to a hat block and the fact that I removed the rather rustly plastic lining and um, the headband, it now fits. It can sit on the back of the head, very Tom Baker style. And I, I quite like, I always like a hat over one eye a bit and pulled down and it can do that. And as, as I keep wearing it and battering it, it'll hopefully look a bit more worn in like his. It wasn't a new hat to start with, but it was a pretty unworn hat. And um, yeah, I think if you wanted to go fully into town, it should be a bit of a greyer, a greyer or a greener brown. But, you know, I quite like this shade. Not that it then goes with the browns that I'm wearing today. Anyway, that's all irrelevant. So I have a hat to add to the ensemble if I want to. I need some jelly babies and a yo-yo still if I'm going to um, fully personify the character with my everyday clothes, which is what I want to do. I don't want to make this a I'm in cosplay thing. Anyway, that's that, that's for now. I'll leave you with some reveal of the overall thing and... Um...